Thank you. Good evening. Um, hopefully I'll talk a little bit about more than just the um, housing in Medellin. Um, this is fast forward Medellin and um, let's begin with um, let's play press play Medellin 1990 um, I'm 18 years old and I'm in the first part of my mandatory military service. Um, my platoon has been ordered to <coughs> escort a um, humanitarian aid mission to a place called Santo Domingo Sabio. This to me represents a very worrying situation. This is uh, probably the most violent place in the planet. Um, records in Santo Domingo are about to hit, or in Medellin, are about to hit 400, and then uh, numbers above 400. Murders were 100,000 inhabitants. And so Santo Domingo Sabio is a um, barrio located in the edge of the city. Um, it's in that boundary between the built mountain above. It's, it's the edge of the city because uh, basically the slope is too steep to keep building. Um, but people still manage and, and the border is, is very slowly and sometimes very quickly stretching. Um, so once arriving there my first impression was wow you could see the Aurab Valley stretching as far as the eye can see from this place. Amazing view, incredible vantage point. But yet I quickly understood that the people who were living here were completely disconnected from that city. They were isolated, um, they were essentially prisoners, uh, surrounded by walls of violence. This um, this was a very bleak um, moment for the inhabitants there. There's the image on the bottom uh, left hand side of the, of the slide is a still from a movie called Rodrigo de No Futuro, which basically brings to the screen this, this, um, the life of, of the young people in this area of the city and um, the, the sense of of isolation, violence, <coughs> devastation, and basically as its title says, no futuro, no future. This is just a clip of the movie. We need to get a bit of a sense of how it felt over there during that time. The film is late 80s. life on the terraces in the you know, and that was pretty much uh, what people were sort of had the poss possibility of doing in open spaces. So now um, my, uh, what you could see in people's eyes was basically chaos, um, isolation and hopelessness. But let's fast forward 20 years, 2010 now. I'm back in Santo Domingo. This time I'm with my partner and my one-year-old daughter. We've come to see this place, come to see this place again. And um, we, sorry, and then I can't, um, when, once we start going up the slope in one of these cables, cable cars, this very silent, uh, but sort of rocky by uh, over the, this steep urban landscape. I can't help but remember what I felt 20 years ago. Um, and the transformation is incredible. Uh, where there was once chaos, I now see uh, a transportation system which is uh, 
impeccable. It's brought us here from the other end of the city in less than an hour. Um, and what I can see from this cable car's cabin is, is um, an urban cityscape that is now <coughs> stitching this uh, unplanned patches of, of, of the city and providing very, very broad and generous walk, walk, walkways for uh, pedestrians and parks and now the public infrastructure is very, very visible. Well, there was once isolation. Now I see people coming from near and far to visit this place, to see the city from this perspective. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, it's like they lifted the walls of this prison and instead of the prisoners fleeing, it's the whole world pouring in. Um, it's quite remarkable, it's bizarre. <coughs> you hear people speaking English, German, even Russian, and that is mixing the very local slang and accents of the inhabitants. Um, quite a mix. Um, and uh, from the cabin as well, you can see the local businesses thriving. You can also share the cab with people who are returning from work uh, in the afternoon with a few hours to, to spare enjoying quality time with the families, something that was absolutely impossible before. And where there was hopelessness, uh, I see well, hope. I see it in the eyes of, of a kid who's sharing this cable car ride with us. Um, he's telling us, t telling us all about how this uh, barrio has has uh, improved, um, and and how proud he feel, feels um, of, of of this uh, new environment that he's living in. And he's telling us exactly why everyone is coming over to see this from everywhere. So um, I can see the, 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 the pride in his eyes. Um, and also very importantly, from the cable car, we see these beacons of the urban landscape, these new beacons that are um, a library, a school, and a center for entrepreneurs. Um, so, it's quite a transformation, but it's a transformation that didn't happen in a span of 20 years. Um, um, it's actually something relatively recent. And, but I, I also know that, that um, change started to brew uh, shortly after my first visit to San Domingo. Now, let's, let's rewind. Uh, yeah. This is a view from, from the top of Santo Domingo Sabio, now looking down to the city, still the, the beautiful vantage point it, was up, it had always been, but now <coughs> this is a place that's being embraced by the city and it's also embracing the city. <coughs> so let's rewind to 1996 and um, go back to uh, when I was a student in Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana uh, in Medellin, this was a really exciting time to be a student. Um, the schools of architecture in uh, Universidad Nacional and Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana uh, were leading um, research into the city, um, trying to figure out how best to provide uh, social interventions or urban interventions, architectural interventions that would improve um, the, the, the city. Um, it was a very exciting time because although war, it was pretty much a war show in, in, the, in the city, uh, this, this university was, or the universities, uh, were havens for thought and for this, um, for this sort of change, spirit of change to, to emerge. Um, and also, uh, we had the, the possibility of having uh, in, people coming from all over the world to provide inspiration and tell us about their ex 